I believe with all my heart that you will be blessed today and that you will be a blessing. We are looking forward to something we've never done before on Capitol Hill, and that is to give a Bible to each and every legislator and statewide official. And not stop there, but to pray for those men and women, to encourage those men and women, and as it says in the scriptures, to honor those men and women. And I will tell you, confession time, there's a few of those characters that I really struggle to honor. And I have to repent. And so we're doing that. We're trying to honor those people who give a lot of time and sacrifice. And frankly, we would like to see some of them uh, read that Bible and follow what's in it. So uh, we are undertaking a neat, neat initiative that Bob Vanderplatz and Greg Baker and others in our ministry, Vicki Crawford and others, um, envisioned a few months ago. And thanks to your generosity, has become a reality. So praise God. Um, I would like to invite here in a moment uh, the pastor of the Family Leader Foundation's Board of Directors, Bill Tweet from Oskaloosa Jubilee Family Church, to open us. I asked prayer. Brother Greg Baker if I could share just a couple of things. So I'm just going to read just a little bit out of Psalms 2. The Bible says, Be wise now, ye therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are they that put their trust in the Lord. And the part that I want you to take notice of today is it says, be instructed ye judges of the earth. What we're doing today is biblical. We are giving them the greatest book of instruction that they will ever receive in their life. You know, it's always best, the best way to have a godly leadership in the civil realm is to choose godly leaders, like it says in Exodus 18, 21. But we also can persuade. Agrippa told Paul, he said, Paul, all, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. We're called to persuade as well. We're also called to pray for those who are in office. In Timothy, it tells us, pray for all those in authority and kings and that we might live a peaceable life. And our, our religious liberty really depends upon that. So let's bow our heads this morning. Let's go before the Lord. Father, we just thank you. What a great opportunity that we can bring the word of God to our leaders in the civic realm. And Father, we just ask that you would send us as laborers to them because Jesus prayed that we would be laborers and to pray that we would send forth the laborers into the harvest. Father, reveal your goodness. Father, it's your goodness that leads to repentance. And Father, that, that goodness reveals how evil we really are. And it brings us sorrow that leads to repentance. Father, take away the darkness from their eyes. Your word says, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine. And your word says, the entrance of thy word, it gives light and it gives understanding to the simple. Father, give us favor today. You said in your word that our gift will make room for us. May this gift of a Bible make room in the hearts of these legislators to hear what we have to say today. Father, we pray even as uh, we go before them to persuade, not just to pray, but also to persuade. David had the tongue as of a pen of a ready writer. Isaiah said, give me the tongue of the learned that I might speak a word in season. Stephen, it says that they could not resist the spirit and the wisdom by which he spoke. Paul asked for boldness. He asked for a door of utterance. He asked that he might be able to speak to every man as he ought to speak. Father, we ask for that today. And Father, we especially thank you for Dr. Tackett being with us today to bring to us information, inspiration, and an impartation of your word to prepare us to go forth today as laborers into the legislative world to be a blessing and to bring Christ to each and every one. We thank you for this. We ask your blessing now. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe. 
displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. Praise God. Thank you. It's my privilege and honor to introduce my boss and dear friend, uh, the president of the Family Leader Foundation, Bob Vanderplotz. Bob, thanks for being here. Thanks for what you do. God bless you, brother. Thank you so much for showing up. And thank you for bearing with the roads and getting here and going through all that. Today, you're going to be part of a special day. And we're so thankful to all of you for your participation in helping sponsor Bibles that are going to go to each and every elected legislator in the state of Iowa. All the executive branch and seven Supreme Court justices. Now, is that a cool thing or what? That they are going to be presented the Word of God. Everybody has maybe their favorite Bible. This Founder's Bible has become at least my go-to Bible. Because not only does it give the scripture in all of its entirety, but it also links our country's heritage, our country's founding, all throughout with stories and attributes to our founders and to those who helped shape this country along with scripture. It's become a very good thing and it will be a great resource for those elected officials who are actually making law, executing law in our state. But there's another little cool thing that goes along with this. I was just told yesterday, I was driving home from the office and I got, got a phone call and they said, Bob, we are so excited about what the family leader's doing at the state of Iowa and putting these Bibles in all the elected officials' hands and the seven Supreme Court justices. I just wanted to inform you 
that the state of South Dakota is following suit and the state of Kansas is following suit. They're doing it as well. Sometimes I think it's good if we go back to our founding. We go back to our founding in a culture and in a society that screams out, we need to evolve, we need to evolve. Sometimes I think we need to go back to the timeless standards. The timeless standard where God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to read just a couple of things out of the Founder's Bible. And there's a lot. I mean, if you get a Founder's Bible, and I hope you do get one. As you go through the scriptures and you tie the history to the scriptures, it's throughout the entire, throughout the entire Bible. I'm going to focus on the Sermon on the Mount. Probably the greatest speech ever given. Even secular people who go through and they critique speeches, they say it's probably the best speech ever given in the history of speeches. The Sermon on the Mount. Matter of fact, if you read Matthew 5 through 7, it'll take you all of 12 to 15 minutes to read that, which is probably a good indicator for all of us who get up to speak or lead churches. Maybe 12 to 15 minutes can suffice once in a while. But there's other times that Jesus was longer. And the reason I'm focusing on the Sermon on the Mount is that last week, Monday, a week ago yesterday, I was given the opportunity to deliver a message on the Mount of the Beatitudes in Israel. And it is quite a sight, quite a scene to see the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum where Jesus did a lot of his teaching, a lot of the miracles right there and then to be on the Mount of the Beatitudes. But if you go to the Founder's Bible, and it's on page 1438, it's called His Desire to Answer Prayer. The cornerstone of what we're doing at the Family Leader right now is on a project we call If 714. If 714, based on 2 Chronicles 714. Because as much as we believe that the politics in this country and in this state and in our community need to change and get back to the heart of God, His principles and His precepts, we believe this country, this culture truly needs a spiritual revival. Yeah, right. And so what we ask people to do is set your alarms for 714 in the morning, 714 in the evening, not to be legalistic about your prayer life, but to be reminded about praying for revival in this country. And that revival begins with me. And it begins with you. And it begins with our marriages and our families. Our churches and our communities. And hopefully the ripple effect is off to a country. But we believe we need a spiritual revival. His desire to answer prayer. Now that I'm over 50, I know that's a shocker to many of you. I need to wear readers. Prayer, this is what it says. Prayer has always been central to biblical faith. Highlighted in dozens of examples throughout the scriptures and was therefore also deeply embedded in the American life. In fact, colonial state and federal governments issued over 1,400 official calls to prayer between 1620 and 1815. The founding fathers clearly were convinced of the efficacy of prayer. This country was built on a foundation of prayer. Some people say that they believe that the Constitution is a divine instrument, that the founders had to be divinely guided. Why do you think that is? Because of their commitment to prayer. John Jay, who was the original Chief Justice on the U.S. Supreme Court, believed that the fact that God had told us to pray and that he'd even told us how to pray and what to pray for was a clear indication that he wanted to answer our prayers. As he explained, had it not been the purpose of God that his will should be done on earth as it is done in heaven, he would not have commanded us to pray for it. That command implies a prediction and a promise that in due season it shall be accomplished. Wouldn't it be great if we had Supreme Court justices today who were quoted saying those types of things? 
It then goes on, he says, the prayer well known to the founding fathers appeared in the American public school textbooks for well over two centuries. And an elderly John Quincy Adams attested that it was one of the first things he had learned as a youngster, that the Lord's Prayer was in our textbooks for over two centuries. A deep commitment to prayer, getting back to our roots. But then I want to go over here to the next page, and it's all based on Matthew 7, verse 12. The legislature today is going to deal with things that they refer to as bullying. As a former teacher and a former high school principal, there should be no put down of other kids for at any time and for any reason. And if it happens, they should be addressed. It takes leadership at the local level to make it happen. But you don't need a whole program. You don't need a lot of conferences on anti-bullying message. Go right to the scriptures. And this one's entitled, The Golden Rule. In the latter part of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, he delivers what today is known as the golden rule, instructing the people in everything, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Ever since Jesus raised that standard two millennia ago, it has remained not only the benchmark of how we should treat others, but also our motivation for doing so. The golden rule was regularly invoked by early American leaders. For exam example, founding father Henry Lawrence, a president of Congress during the American Revolution, hoped that Americans living by the golden rule would lead to the end of slavery. Anticipating, I abhor slavery, he said, the day I hope is approaching when from principles of gratitude as well as justice, every man will strive to be foremost in showing his readiness to comply with the golden rule. John Adams saw the golden rule as a Christian teaching that would produce a society and a culture that would be a blessing to all citizens. One great advantage of the Christian religions is that it brings the great principle of the law of nature and nations. Love your neighbor as yourself, Luke 10, verse 27, and to do to others as you would that others should do to you, Matthew 7, verse 12 to the knowledge, belief, and veneration of the whole people. I think it would be good when policymakers who are designed or who are elected to make laws, create laws, that they would go back to this resource and find out what did the founders intend. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was delivering that message on the Mount of the Beatitudes, I told the, the people listening there to think bigger. Think bigger. Sometimes we put our hope into elected officials. Sometimes we put our hope into state and the national governments. But think bigger. These were the disciples that when Jesus said, hey, come and follow me, that they left and they followed him. These were the disciples on the boat and the storm went nuts. And Jesus woke up and he calmed the storm. These are the disciples that saw Jesus walk on water on the Sea of Galilee. These are the disciples that watched Jesus raise a dead man back to life. Who caused a blind man to see the lame to walk. They saw all the miracles. They saw him feed 5,000 with two loaves of bread and five fish. And there were leftovers. And after he delivered his sermon on the mount. He walked down from the Sermon on the Mount and you knew that he knew that he delivered a great message. Now that might be a duh, huh? I mean, he's God. But he delivered a great, and he knew he delivered a great message. And he saw how the crowd took it in. And as he was walking down and the disciples with him, he turned to the disciples. He said, who do they say that I am? And the disciples said, well, some of them say you're John the Baptist. Some of them say you're Elijah. Some of you say that you're, you're one of the prophets. And then being the good teacher, Jesus turned it. And he said, 
Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And all the disciples, you could have heard a pin drop. It was crickets. Except for Peter. Peter said, you're the Messiah. And Jesus said, you're right. And all the disciples were like, that's what I was going to say, that you're the Messiah. But Peter said it first, you're the Messiah. And then Jesus went on. He predicted what was going to happen to him. He, he was going to be taken. He was going to be tortured. He was going to be put up onto a cross. And three days later, he was going to rise again and conquer death. And Peter took him off to the side. And Peter basically rebuked Jesus. And said, don't think that way. We've got a good thing going. You're healing people. People are seeing. People are walking. You're feeding people with two loaves and five fish. We've got a good thing going, Jesus. Don't wreck it now. Matter of fact, if we do this right, we will overtake the government and we will overtake Rome. And I'll have a seat at the table. And Jesus to Peter said, get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. What Jesus was saying to Peter is, think bigger. Think bigger. I didn't come to overcome Rome. I didn't come to lead the government. I didn't come to, to, to have whatever human endeavor or human accomplishment you might want to put on me. I came to save the world. Think bigger. As much as we would like to see everything righted in our country politically, let's earnestly pray for a spiritual revival and let it begin with you and let it begin with me. Thank you for doing your part today. Thank you. Might sound like a small thing, but it's been a huge thing in my life to set my smartphone for 714 in the morning and at night. I really implore you to do that. I don't know about you, but life gets full, busy, and I need those reminders. And what an amazing thing God wants to do through us as we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our own wicked ways. Judgment begins with the house of God. Let's us lead in this, folks. Let's us lead in this. Not expect the pagans to lead in spiritual revival, but the Christians. Um, it's my great honor to introduce our special speaker. Um, Del Tackett has produced what I think is the finest teaching series on earth. It's called The Truth Project. I'm going through it right now with my 17-year-old son. I've gone through it with my other kids. Gone through it at church about six or seven times. And if you haven't been through The Truth Project, you are missing out. I beg you to pick up a copy and go through The Truth Project. Dell is working on sort of the next iteration, uh, the next turn of the wheel. And we're excited to see what he's going to bring forth next. Um, Dell, why don't you come and share your heart? Dell spoke to legislators this morning at the Capitol and uh, whetted, whetted our appetites. So uh, thanks for that. Thanks for coming here. And God bless you for all your humble work. Thank you, Well, thank you, Chuck. And, uh, Bob, thank you for uh, those, those remarks. I, uh, I'm privileged to be here. And I'm here not only because I think the Lord wants me here, but I'm here because of the family leader and what is going on. Uh, you have, you have an, an amazing opportunity here in the state of Iowa uh, to do, I think, s some great things. And the family leader is, is I, I have a great, great admiration for what is going on there. And I uh, would encourage you to get behind them and to support them. So my task and what I've been asked to do here today uh, is to walk through some things with you that no doubt 
is not new. There's not going to be anything earth-shaking here, not going to be anything really radical. But we're going to walk back through what the basic design of God is for the state. And in so doing, to refresh ourselves again with the responsibilities that God has delegated to the civil magistrate, but also the responsibilities that we have as citizens within that institution. And we want to talk a little bit as well as some special uh, folks within that realm of citizenry, uh, not that they are on a higher order than anyone else, uh, but God has also uh, delegated responsibility authority to pastors, and we want to speak briefly a little bit about those responsibilities to understand as citizens uh, to make sure we're clear of what God has also called them to do and what he's not called them to do. And if we have a little bit of a time, we may also talk about business and because there is also a responsibility I think that God is calling us to in this whole realm. So, where do we go to begin? Where do we always start? Uh, I usually tell all of my students uh, from the very beginning, we make this very, very clear that any time you begin to study any kind of an issue, uh, even if you're talking about some sort of a controversy, some question that you might have, the source, the ultimate source of all truth is found in the nature and character of God. It is the attributes of God, it is the very being and character of God that is the source of all truth. All truth flows from, proceeds from, is sourced in the very nature and character of God. So when we go back and take a look at the nature and character of God, especially in the context of what we're looking at here today, we're driven back to that amazing aspect of God that He, the God uh, who created everything, the creator of the universe, is a God who is socially complex. He is not a monolithic God. You know that term? Monolithic. Men have a tendency to make up uh, gods, and those gods are monolithic. In other words, they do not have any social complexity within them. But the God that we serve, and, there, and I'm speaking to you from um, a perspective that we will call a biblical worldview. That's what we're here to discuss. Uh, if you're not from that perspective, that's fine. You can listen in to, to what someone who stands uh, on the perspective of a biblical worldview, how they view the state and why we act the way we do, why we act so strange. Okay. So the very nature, the very character of God, that he is socially complex, is critical to our understanding, first of all, of why there is social order of all. But even beyond that, when we look at the nature of God from a biblical worldview perspective, we know that God is socially complex. And so he consists of uh, what we name the Father, and what the Scripture names the Father, the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. And those three persons of the triune God are in perfect unity, they're in perfect harmony. The triune God within himself sources the whole thing that we, that we understand about social order. Fellowship, communion, communication, love, all of those things that we normally associate with social kinds of things are already bound up in the very nature of God. He has for all eternity been a social being. And because he is the ultimate diversity bound up in unity, the unity of diversity, we should not be surprised that we see a universe created by a God who is socially complex, a universe that is filled with diversity and the unity of that diversity. A universe that is filled with some of the most exquisite systems in which we find diverse pieces and parts all coming together in a unity that serves some higher purpose that cannot come from a monolithic God. 
that cannot come from a God who is of one substance where there is no notion of unity. There's no notion of diversity. There's no notion of relationships at all. But in the triune God, in the God who is socially complex, we naturally see a universe that is filled with unity and diversity. And beyond that, we see that God has then created what we would call social order. That he is the one who has established and created the social institutions, the social systems that we see around us. The very first one he created was the family. And he brought together two very, very diverse human beings. Now, if you want to listen to the world around us, the world around us will say that there is a, there is a different perspective on this. I understand that. The world will actually say that, and quite frankly, I think this is humorous, to say that there is no difference between male and female. Those people must have never gotten married. <laughs> Men and women are drastically different, not just physically. Men and women are different. Fundamentally, they're different. And they're different in this diverse sort of way that brings glory to God because of what? Because of the unity. So God, God brought together the male and the female, and he brought them together in a unity so that they might bring forth children. That's what we read in Malachi. Now this is, let me introduce you to something that's maybe a little new, I don't know. It's going to be radical, but it may be a little new. In Malachi, we are told that God brought together the male and the female. He made them one. And then it says, and why did he make them one? What was the purpose of God for making them one? The purpose was to bring forth fruit, godly offspring. That was the reason that he brought forth, brought the, the, the male and the female together. Now this leads us back again to what I, I refer to, don't, don't get scared by the big word here, it's, it's, not that, it's not that difficult, but the overall meta-narrative of God, the overall meta-narrative of God is evidenced in the creation itself, in the very narrative. Now, we're too familiar with this. I understand that. And sometimes some of the most profound things go in one ear and out the other. And the reason is because we, we've heard it too many times. Do you know what I'm talking about? When we look at what God did in the garden, he did one of the most profound things. When he created the plants, he did not create the plants in such a way that they were just simply to look good in the garden. You know, I need a philodendron over there, and you know, and a, what's your favorite flower? Pick a rose, I say rose, okay, a rose over there. Uh, now they are beautiful, but think about what God did. He created the plants, and then he equipped them, and he empowered them, and then he sent them that the plants themselves might be agents of new life, that the plants themselves might bring forth new life, that they would be fruitful, and that fruit, as Jesus said, brings glory to God. He did the same with the animals. He didn't create the animals so they would look good roaming in the garden. He created the animals, he equipped them, he empowered them, created them male and female, so that they might be agents of new life, that they might bring forth fruit. And then he did the same with Adam and Eve. He created Adam and Eve, he brought them together, he equipped them and he empowered them. God delegated his own power out of his own nature as the creator, as the creator, he delegated that to the male and female, to the human being, to the plants, to the animals. He delegated that. He empowered them. He delegated his own power to them and responsibility and authority that the creatures of God would bring forth fruit. 
Now this is absolutely critical because I'm going to submit to you that virtually all of the social systems of God have as their fundamental purpose to bring forth fruit or to foster the bringing forth of fruit. And that's exactly what we see in that first social institution we call the family. But let's look now at the purpose that we're here, uh, gathered together to talk about the state and how God has designed that state. In, and we're jumping forward, for those who've been in the Truth Project, we spent some time trying to build the case for this design. Um, you can go back and look at that. You can go back to the scriptures itself and you'll find that God places himself specifically within this social system. And there's a reason for that. And we'll come back in just a second. He then delegates, should not be surprising, he delegates authority. God delegates his own authority, his own power, his own responsibility to, and we'll just put the king here, to a civil magistrate. The civil magistrate has certain roles and responsibilities that are outlined within, especially in Romans 13 and 2 Peter and other passages, and I think throughout the entire scripture. He has a role and responsibility in the design of God. And then, of course, we have the citizens who are also part of this social institution. And the citizens themselves also carry responsibilities which um, are outlined within the scripture itself, too. So let's look at this for just a second, because what God has done, he has, again, delegated authority, delegated a power to the civil magistrates. We had a, we had a great session this morning with, uh, with a number of the legislators, and we talked about their role, their responsibility, that they have been given this amazing privilege to hold a divine position. And it's divine, why? Because part of the design of God, that he has delegated to them the responsibility to fulfill that position of authority and power. But they must never forget that they are accountable to God. Now, we have a lot of lessons that God has made clear for us in particular for the king to never forget that he is accountable to God. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of a world empire. Most historians refer to Babylon as a world empire. And Nebuchadnezzar was at the top. He was the chief civil magistrate. And Nebuchadnezzar was on the roof of his palace one day. And I know this is astounding to you to think that a ruler could get too big for his britches. <laughs> really, what a weird thing. So Nebuchadnezzar standing on the roof of his palace, he's looking at Babylon. And he simply declares, is this not the great Babylon that I have built for my glory? by my might and my strength and my power, and bam, just like that. God put him out in the pasture on fours, eating grass like a cow. That and a lot of other instances in the scripture make it clear that the civil magistrate must never, ever begin to think that he is not accountable to God. Remember David? When David looked, was on the roof of his palace, it's not good for a king to be on the roof of his palace. <laughs> David looked and he saw Uriah's wife. And you know the story. David believed that he could take whatever he wanted. And then God sent a prophet to David and told him that weepy story. Remember about a rich man 
who had all this stuff, and a poor man who had only one little lamb, and the lamb was like a child to him, and the lamb even slept with him. It was only a little lamb, and somebody came to visit the rich man, but he didn't want to take any of his stuff, so he took this poor man's lamb and slaughtered it and cooked it. And David burned with anger, do you remember? And the prophet said, David, you are that man. Well, David wept. And he wept because David had an understanding of what was right and what was true. Do you remember Ahab? Ahab thought he could take whatever he wanted. He saw Naboth's vineyard, and he wanted the vineyard. And in a collusion between he and his wife Jezebel, they used the law with the king's signature and the law and so forth to take that vineyard, to put him to death to take the vineyard. And God sent a prophet to tell him, the dogs will lick up your blood. It doesn't take long to look through all that Uzziah, remember the great king Uzziah, who thought he had the right to step into the sphere of the church and to offer incense. And God struck him with leprosy. My friends, over and over and over again, the scripture will tell us that God is the one who has designed this institution. And the authority that he has granted to the king is an authority that must always be held in the understanding that the king is subject and accountable to God. And that when he begins to act in a way that he is no longer accountable to God, that is not good. Now, for a little bit of the negative aspect of our talk today, it is my extreme sadness to inform you that we today have removed God from this picture. We no longer speak of Him in the context of our crafting laws. We no longer acknowledge Him in our statesmanship. We no longer uh, appeal to Him. We no longer show that we are accountable to Him. In essence, we have, in our nation today, removed Him. Now, you can't remove God. For a while, David thought he had removed God, right? He thought he had done this and, and hidden it all. Ahab thought he, he had gotten away with this. He'd gotten, he had gotten the vineyard. There were consequences of what Ahab done, had done. Naboth was dead. But my friends, and I, and I don't mean for this to be negative. We're talking, we want to talk about the reality. And, and sometimes to talk about the reality, we have to talk about the reality. And my friends, is that we are in a situation today where the civil magistrate whether that is, <laughs> say, the king in Washington, D.C. <laughs> By that, I mean the entire federal, the federal government, or whether we're talking about the, the republics that have been established as states, or even if we go down further into the counties and so forth, we essentially, in our nation, have rejected the notion that we are accountable to God. In fact, you will be laughed at, you will be you would pillified, is that the word? Vilified, pillared in the media. If you're a civil magistrate and you hint that there is an accountable being to which we must make an appeal when we're crafting legislation and so forth. Well, that's the negative part. Let's talk about the positive thing here for just a second because this is what is really real. That's how it really looks. So let's talk about your responsibility, my responsibility as a citizen in this institution that God has established. What is our role in all of this? Well, first of all, we need to go back, step back. Remember we were talking about the meta-narrative? 
We were talking about the meta narrative of God that in the very beginning he did this un unthinkable thing which is so contrary to people who have power today to distribute that power, to delegate that power to the lowest level, that the lowest level might bring forth fruit. Remember I mentioned to you, I'm submitting to you that all of the social institutions are for that very purpose. And I'm going to submit to you that this institution is for that purpose as well. Now certainly Romans 13 is very, very clear in terms of two of the fundamental purposes for which God has designed the state. It's reiterated in 2 Peter. And fundamentally, the state's responsibility is to punish evil and to condone what is good. To punish evil and to condone what is good. Now, I am a, I am a fan of Noah Webster. Noah Webster is my, my favorite of the, of the founding fathers. And I want to read to you his definition of politics. This is radical. It's why I, I have the 1828 dictionary right at the ready all the time. I refer to it over and over again. And especially if I'm dealing with people who are talking about the founding era, because most people today will talk about the founding era and they will use our definitions and impose them upon that era. You need to understand how people use those words. But this is a very interesting and a very radical definition of politics. But I, I want us to pay attention to what they understood this thing called politics and what it meant. Let me read this to you. This is what politics is. Politics is the science of government. That part of ethics. Politics was a part of ethics, which consists in the regulation and government of a nation or state for the preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity and the protection of its citizens in their rights with the preservation and improvement of their morals. Now why in the world would Noah Webster say that the definition of politics is for the improvement of the citizens' morals? Well, most of you are probably astute enough to know that the two foundations that the founders wrote over and over about, the two foundations they spoke of continually, George Washington called them our indispensable supports. Patrick Henry said that these were our, our surest pillars and without them we would fail. Virtually every one of the founders referred to these two foundations that they were, what they had built everything on, their hope for liberty, their hope for freedom. They'd even built the Constitution upon these two foundations. Over and over again they spoke of those. I ask my college students all the time if they know what those foundations are. They don't know. I ask a lot of people, what are the two foundations that the founders built? this nation, but they don't know. I went through 12 years of American education institution and it was never taught to me. I got an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and a doctorate degree from American institutions and they were never expressed. I went to pilot training, I went to military training to, to hone the skills of an American fighting man. I never heard them once. Does this seem strange to you? Does it seem strange to you that the two foundations that the founder pointed to over and over and over again said, these are our surest pillars. Without these, we will fail. Religion and morality. Religion and morality. 
But morality was key to the founders because they believed they could not write a constitution, they could not create a government that was powerful enough to contend with a people that was unbridled in morality. Those are almost the direct words of one of the founders. And where does the morality come from? George Washington's farewell address. He said, it's silly for anyone to think that morality can subsist without religion. Religion, and in that case, they were talking about the Christian worldview that existed in that time. I've done a lot of study in the founding era. A lot of study. And I can tell you with a surety that the founding generations, the founding generations, not perfect, but the founding generations carried a biblical worldview. Yes, there were imperfections there. Yes, there were blind spots, but they basically carried a biblical worldview. And that is why in those days, it merely took a word to call people to task. Sometimes it was merely to refer to a Bible passage because they shared a biblical worldview. My friends, those days are gone. And I say that to you not for you to lose hope. I say that to you because we need to understand the times in which we live. If you think that we're going to change this nation with sound bites, you're wrong. The sound bite is not going to change this world anymore. We don't, we don't live in the 16 and 1700s. If we're going to change our culture, we're going to have to change it in a way that Jesus told us to. And that was by and you and I to engage our neighbor in a long-term relationship. Do you remember Wilberforce? William Wilberforce all of a sudden began to hear the clinking of the chains on the slaves. He began to smell the, the stench of the slave ships. Why? Because God had done a major work in his life. And he began the process of working through Parliament but that process took 26 years. 26 years because Wilberforce realized that if he was going to change Parliament, it wasn't going to happen through an eloquent speech. He learned that on the very first day when he delivered that speech and people were yelling and throwing stuff at him. And so he began the long and arduous task of building a relationship with his fellow parliamentarians, persuading them with an attractively winsome attitude. He had another object before him. It was not just the abolition of the slave trade, but it was to revive England. And he and those who began to work with him began the process over years and years and years of engaging people in a deeper and deeper relationship to eventually persuade them. It took 26 years before England finally voted to abolish the slave trade. And then it took another 20 years to free the slaves. My friends, this is not going to happen with a sound bite. It's not going to happen in our neo-Christianity, drive-by Christianity way. It's going to happen because you and I are going to roll up our sleeves and get engaged in a deep relationship with your neighbors. So the king's responsibility in the state, going back to the meta-narrative, and this is what we spoke of this morning, and I speak to you from the standpoint of you need to understand from your perspective because you need to know when the king, when the civil magistrate is not doing what he's supposed to do. Fundamentally, I'm going to submit to you. Noah Webster said it, do you remember? 
politics is for the preservation of its safety, peace, and prosperity. And I'm going to submit to you that the fund fundamental purpose of the state is to bring about the prosperity, not in the, not in the health, wealth kind of a deal. I'm talking about the shalom of the people, the citizens, fulfilling what God has made them to be. The ability to plant a field, the ability to, to make shoes, the ability to have a small business. And that the fundamental purpose of the state is to ensure that the citizen has the freedom and the right to do so. As we spoke of today, I, I encourage them to ponder this. I said, think of this, that whenever a piece of legislation comes uh, across your desk, whether it's to, uh, to begin to craft legislation or whether to try to get you to, um, uh, to support legislation, that you ask yourself the question, does this legislation encourage and promote the prosperity of our people in Iowa? Or does it chill that? Let me let you in on a little secret. The enemy will always do the opposite of what God wants. Think with me again. The meta narrative of God is that He delights, He desires, He has a zeal to delegate authority to distribute authority to the smallest creature, that the smallest creature might be fruitful. The enemy will consolidate power and make dependence. The enemy will consolidate power and authority in order to destroy the fruitfulness of God's creatures. That is what we see happening. And that will continue to happen. Why? Because in the beginning, God created a universe that was tilted towards life and fruitfulness. That was what he wanted, and everything flowed that way. But you and I know something drastically happened, and it all now tilts the other way. Everything flows towards death and destruction. If you float in this world, if you float as a citizen in this world, I can guarantee you where you'll end up. If you float in your relationship to your husband or your wife, I guarantee you it will flow downhill. If you don't tend your garden, you know what will happen to it. If you don't tend to, this, to the matters of civil government, do you know what will happen? What has already happened? Because that's the way it flows. You and I must, must swim against that. Don't get frustrated by that. If you wake up, if, you're, if you have a garden and you wake up in the morning and you look out and there's weeds in your garden and you throw your hoe down and stomp off and say, I'm sick of this, those weeds, I hoed that last week. You will never make a good gardener. Do not lose hope. Do not give up. I want to say something briefly about the pastors and then, and then we have to quit. Your pastors, if you look at Ephesians chapter 4, have a divine calling as well. They're in a divine position. And Ephesians 4, that their responsibility is to equip you for the work of ministry. My friends, we've turned the church upside down. We now, as the congregants, think that our job is to equip the pastor and he does the work of spiritual ministry. Wrong. You will burn your pastor out. And that's what's happening. We also have begun to think, I think this is Old Testament thinking, begin to think that it's the pastor's sole role to speak to the king and say you do wrong. The Spirit of God was poured out upon whom? 
at Pentecost? All the clerics? No. The Spirit of God was poured out on God's people. You have a responsibility. Don't put this on your pastor alone. Yes, it is important for a pastor to speak. But you have the responsibility as well to stand before the king and say, you do wrong. If you do not speak, then we will float. And if we float, then God have mercy upon us. Father, Lord, we come before you acknowledge what you have created is good. The design that you have given to us is right. But Father, we acknowledge before you that as a nation we have rejected you. We have said no to you. We want to do our own thing. We want to design this stuff ourselves. Oh God, forgive us. Be merciful to us. Father, I pray that you would sweep this land, sweep your people, awaken them, breathe upon them, bring upon the bones. That you would raise us up, Father. That we would begin to do what you've asked us to do. We begin to engage people with love, with gentleness, with respect. And persuade them to understand the reality of the path that we're headed on. That we will seek, Father, the prosperity of your creatures. That they might bring glory to you in their fruit. Father, bless this state. What a unique position you've placed them in. Bless the people of this state who are providentially citizens of the Republic of Iowa. That, Father, they may begin to understand their responsibility before God and before the King. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, brother. Uh, William Wilberforce is an inspiration to me. I'm starting my 25th year on Capitol Hill, and I feel like we've got a long ways to go, but we're gonna stick with it. God bless you. Uh, before we go to Greg, who's gonna explain what's happening at the Hill in the next two hours, I want to let you know, we have produced a pamphlet, the Family Leader Foundation, called What is Government's Purpose? It's got most of the key verses in it, and I just encourage you uh, to review that. We'll try to get that out to you maybe in, a, in an upcoming mailing. And then the guy who's done the lion's share of the work on this fabulous Bible project, Greg Baker, God bless you. Why don't you share uh, what we're to do up on Capitol Hill? Thank you, Chuck, and uh, thank you so much, Del, for just being one to come out to Iowa today is what a what a blessing it is to have him here uh, I really believe uh, Del Tackett um, if not the but one of the most experts in the issue of biblical worldview in the United States of America and we've been blessed to have him in Iowa several times and extremely blessed to have him at our capital today as well we had uh, 25 representatives and senators and met with Dell early this morning in a private room where they could feel comfortable just to ask him any questions they had and what was so incredible is um, their day for the breakfast started at 730 we had four other groups at the Capitol are worth a lot more money than let's say a, a focus on the family ministry is but uh, they uh, still took the time to listen to Dell Tackett um, a lot of them gaveled in 11 at 8.30 for their work in the Iowa House. Several of them went down there, prayed, gaveled in, began their work, rushed back upstairs to listen to more to Dr. Tackett. So they really enjoyed their message today. And I know that we'll probably be talking about that for many months to come. So thank you for doing that, Dell. Um, that's not something you get to see in every state. <laughs> this next part of the program we're moving on to is the most important part of what we're doing here today and will have long-term consequences well beyond our time even here on this earth. Um, we in the church believe that we are eternal beings. Either we had a fate of eternity with the Lord the Father or unfortunately eternity apart from Him. And God does desire for every man to be saved. And we are His representatives here and we're going to be going to a people that have a lot of power here. 150 people in this state, including our governor, really determine what direction the state's going to move for the next two years until the next election. And we'll continue to elect beyond that. 
So the people we are going to be visiting today do yield a lot of power to how much liberty the people in this room even have, how much freedom we have to share the gospel. We got many brothers and sisters that we sit here in this room very comfortably in a public funded building talking about God that are losing their heads in the Middle East. In China, they're hiding underneath the grounds. We are so blessed here. And these 150 people we're talking to today really largely control if that power still gets to remain. That's part of the reason why we have as many churches as we have in this state as well, because of religious liberties that many have died for. And let's not forget that and remind these legislators whom it is that they do serve. Because like Del Tackett says, if we don't do it, who's going to? We can't expect the world to go up there and present a biblical worldview. Why would they? I've myself known the Lord for five years now, and if you asked me to go up there six years ago, you would not want me giving you my worldview. I can tell you that much. And it is our responsibility to bring God's word. And that's largely what we're gonna be doing today. This is an incredible project. Um, we will be presenting a Founder's Bible to every single legislator at the Capitol. And I do want to show you all the Founder's Bible, what it's going to look like. Um, the Founder's Bible is an NASB study Bible that's got devotions throughout the Bible written by Dr. David Barton. David Barton runs a ministry called Wall Builders out of Texas. For those of you who do homeschooling or send their kids to private schools, more than likely you've used his curriculum for history. And he is a specialist in early American history, particularly around the founding of our nation. And what he's found is this biblical worldview they had that Dell is talking about. He's actually taken and wrote in devotions on that and put it throughout a study Bible, which is the NASB study Bible, which is known as the Founder's Bible. And you'll notice it's just a regular Bible with devotions inserted throughout it. And we felt for the legislators, not only do we want to give them the word of God, which never returns null and void. We thought it would be an incredible gift to also give them a bit of information on our history. And largely because the people in this room and uh, several of those who are not here today, we're going to be able to give one to every single legislator at the Iowa Capitol and also the entire executive branch in the state of Iowa will be receiving these today. So this incredible opportunity. And we are commanded to honor our legislators. That's why we got one of the nicer copies. We have embossed their names in all the Bibles. On the inside, they get to see a list of every single church that participated and made this possible. And I'm happy to say 130 churches across the state of Iowa participated in this. So there's 130 churches from all across the state that are in here. And here's the even crazier part. 91 of the 100 legislative districts are represented and 45 of the 50 Senate districts. That is how spread out across the state we are in this representation. And we have quite a few here today to actually personally present this Bible to their legislator and letting them know their whole congregation is praying for them. And this is the internal things that we are talking about here. We had a staff meeting on Friday and Bob Vanderplot's always gracious enough to start us off with a devotion. And we are talking about offering our bodies as a living sacrifice. And in Romans 12, Paul commands us to offer that body. But he concludes that with, and then you will be able to discern God's will. Meaning only when we offer ourselves and our lives to Jesus can we ever determine God's will. Why is that? Because my will gets in the way. If I don't offer myself, my things get in the way. The same is true for our legislators. If we want them to fully put God's will and what is right for the people first, they too, like you and me, have to offer themselves like living sacrifice or things get in the way, whether it be elections, concerns at home. These men and women, they're making great sacrifices to be there. These are not your politicians in D.C. that are making six-figure salaries, getting to make it for the rest of their lives, and getting to live in D.C., bring their family with them for five days, and fly back in the weekends. That's not the lives our state legislators live. They make a small salary. They had to leave their home for four months. They moved to Des Moines for four days of the week. A lot of them are younger. They, don't, they have young kids at home. They don't get to see them for four days. 
And a lot of times they have to sacrifice their job. There's not a lot of jobs that are going to give you four months off. So most of them take massive pay cuts to come there. This isn't a year-long job for them. This is a huge sacrifice. We are not lobbying in Washington, D.C. We're lobbying in Des Moines, Iowa. And one thing we encourage people when you talk to these legislators, agree with them or not, show them respect and honor them. Because even if we don't agree with them, a lot of them are doing what they believe in their worldview is best. So the best place you're going to get somewhere with them is if you honor them today. So the very first thing we're encouraging everyone is pray with them and thank them. That's how you have to start this. It's very easy for people like myself who just want to jump right into correction. You're not going to get anywhere with that. It's just like sharing the gospel with somebody else. I, I use way of the master. So if I ask them if they've lied before to help convict them, I'm always honest and say that I've done it as well. We don't want to sit here and finger point. So, I mean, these are just like people in your church. They're, no, they're nobody different. We are a republic like Dell Tech had said. We're a government of the people. These are just regular people in your congregations, and some of you in here today actually have them in your congregations. So I do definitely want to start off with that note. We have one of the most accessible legislators in the country. We're so blessed here. You can't go to D.C. and send in a piece of paper and have your representative come out, I can tell you that much. But here you can. And we have people that are willing to walk you through the process. Once you get up there, you're going to realize how easy it is. And I hope if this is your first time here, it's not your last. We need you to come. We need you to be witnesses. We need you to be a light. As we try for four months of the year, we have a lobbying team of four that represents Jesus Christ at the Capitol. We only see him for four months. You all see him for eight months of the year. And you're the ones that are going to build into their lives and build into that relationship just like you do people in your church. So that's what we're really encouraging you today, especially if you sponsor the Bible. Let this just be the introduction to a relationship with your legislator. We've had quite a few people talking about religious liberty up at the Capitol. Um, the Iowa Marriage Amendment is still in both chambers. And of course, the life issue is always a hot issue every single year. So feel free to openly and respectfully talk to your representative or senator about those issues. Heavenly Father God, we just thank you that all these men and women travel from across the state to their state capital here today, God. We thank you that we do live in a country, Lord, that is a republic, God, where we can actually have influence on our public policy, God. The apostles and the people we read in the Bible did not have that luxury, God. Whatever Nero said is what stood, Lord God. There was no appeal process, Lord. It is an authoritative government. We don't have that here, Lord. Whoever wants to bring their worldview to the table, they can have their hearing, God. Let us be brave, Lord, and let us bring your worldview and what you know is best, God. Who better than the creator of the universe to tell us how to run things, God? Let us be good representation of you today, God. We pray for souls to be saved for eternity, Lord God. We don't ask for the small-term impact, God. We ask for eternal impact today, Lord. So work through each of these people in this room, Lord God. We pray these legislators receive the Bibles, Lord. And we pray they open up and they begin to read them, God. And just let the work to begin to change their lives, Lord, as your word has very much changed mine, God. We know this work is not in vain, Lord. We do it for you and you only. Pray us on the only name we can pray it in this Jesus Christ. Amen.
that make pen on you? Oh, I want you guys to sign this. Since you guys gave it to me, you need to sign it. Go ahead. We've been on the stage together for veteran speeches. I wonder why the fountain's not running. <laughs> yeah. It's all covered up. I'm disappointed. Looks like it's pretty. Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, when I was back here in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. We could go underground. 
we could go all over the place. I suppose you can't do that anymore with all the since. security. Yeah. But, I mean, we could go uh, from building to building.